Um, it is it is 8 a.m. here in San Francisco. We're so excited to see all of you for another WDX VMR. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what that is, um, it's essentially um, one month out of, or one day out of the entire month, we like to reserve um, a space for women in medicine to come together and discuss a case in a safe space. Um, and so we have an all-star cast of um, women who are going to be both presenting um, and discussing and um, supporting us with teaching points and scribing today. So we're really excited. Um, I know Emily has an amazing case for us. Um, if you are a medical student um, or trainee otherwise, um, we would love to have you join us at some point. So if this is something you might be interested in, please reach out to um, any, anyone here um, to let us know that you might be interested in um, discussing with us and we would love to have you. Um, sitting in the lukewarm seat and trying to um, sort of discuss a case together is a great way to advance um, your clinical reasoning skills and also have a lot of fun together. So um, thanks for being here. We're really excited. Um, and maybe we'll do some introductions and go from there. Um, so I should have started with an introduction of myself, but my name is Smitha. I'm a third year resident at UCSF. Um, I am from Atlanta originally, um, but I'm now based out in San Francisco. And when I am not thinking about clinical reasoning um, and doing residency things, I like um, running and biking um, and generally enjoying great San Francisco weather, although it has been rainy and is going to be rainy for the, like the next 10 days here. Um, with that, I will popcorn over to um, Anna. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good Thursday. I think it's Thursday everywhere in the world right now. Um, it's nice to see everyone here. Very excited as well. Um, so I'm Anna. I'm um, also one of the CP solvers. I'm based out in San Francisco and I'm a third year internal medicine resident. Um, and part of the WDX crew. Um, I wanted to um, highlight again Smith's points about um, uh, being here as a discussant. Really excited to have Chloe and Valley join us uh, today. Um, and that's really like what this space is all about. It's about like um, uh, women or generally people who are underrepresented in the clinical reasoning environment, um, kind of building um, confidence and skills in, um, in the uh, diagnostic reasoning space. Um, and we hope that this is able to translate to your own clinical practice and your um, educational experience wherever you may be in the world. Um, so very honored to have Valet and Chloe with us today. It's going to be a, a great case. Um, let's see. I actually am feeling right at home in the rain. I'm from the Pacific Northwest from Vancouver Island. And so I feel very happy, although I do have to bike to the VA later. So I'm going to look like a wet rat. Um, but for now I'm cozy inside and I'm going to pass it over to Chloe. Hi guys. Uh, my name is Chloe. I'm a fourth year medical student at UCSF, uh, also currently in San Francisco and have cracked the window to hear the rain. Um, we, I feel like we haven't had much rain this year, so I'm honestly pretty excited for it right now, bringing all my teas and cozying up. Um, it's my first time being a discussant, so I'm super excited to um, tackle a case and learn from you guys. And I will popcorn Maria. Hi friends, uh, my name is Maria. I'm a last year medical student in Guatemala and I'm gonna be doing teaching points today. Really excited to be here. Uh, Promise, do you wanna say hi? Hi everyone, I'm a second year medical student in the US. Um, it's also very rainy and cloudy today in Chicago. Um, yes, and I underdressed, <laughs> but that's okay. And let's go to Valais um, uh, as another one of our discussants. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Vale, I'm from Peru, and I'm, I'm also a medical student. I'm really honored to be here among women that I admire so much uh, to discuss the case. And I will say that at Sort of Medicine, I love running. I am also training for a half marathon, which I think is something that Smita mentioned uh, a couple of years ago. And I, will, I also wanted to recommend an essay book that I finished a couple of weeks ago called uh, This is Pleasure by Mary Gatsky. I think it's very, very appropriate for women in the XBMR 
because it talks about um, how it is when someone that's your friend uh, is accused of uh, sexual harassment or something of that nature and, and how it's kind of conflicting being a woman and having the conversation. So really excited for today's case. And then Emily, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily. I am one of the, like Smitha and Anna, I'm one of the third year residents at, um, at UCSF. Uh, originally from Massachusetts, uh, but now I think I'm on the West Coast forever. <laughs> um, and let's see, things about me like quarantine, new quarantine hobbies, um, got a road bike, so very into biking and also um, trying to get good at tennis and uh, pickleball. Amazing. Um, do we wanna start screen sharing and then Emily, feel free to um, take it away. Chloe, um, we will take the first aliquot. So after Emily sort of gives us the first bit, um, you can sort of share your thoughts and then um, we'll have Vale and Emily do so after the second aliquot. Great. Okay, great. So um, the case, the one-liner to start is this is a 31-year-old man um, with HIV who is admitted for um, an enlarging right-sided neck mass. Um, he was um, directly admitted from um, the outpatient setting because he lived in a rural area and couldn't get um, expedited work up there. So to take a step back um, for his relevant kind of foreground, um, in the three months, pr uh, three months prior to admission, he was admitted for, um, for dysphagia, odynophagia, and a 30 pound weight loss. Didn't have any past medical history at that point, was, uh, but was have found to have HIV with a CD4 count of 48, uh, which was complicated by candida esophagitis. Um, with some possible nodularity in his esophagus um, concerning for malignancy on the EGD um, and late latent syphilis. Um, he was started on um, ARVs with Victegravir, Emtricitabine, and Tenofovir, and then also put on Bactrim prophylaxis, of course, of fluconazole for his um, candida esophagitis, and received in total three IM penicillin shots. Um, was initially doing well after the hospitalization, but, um, but six weeks prior to admission, um, he developed a small bump on the right side of his neck uh, that was firm and immobile. And around the time when it first appeared, he had a fever up to 101, um, which was attributed at the time to his, um, to his syphilis treatment because he had gotten penicillin shots around that time. Uh, the mass over those six weeks grew, became more painful, became red and, and fluctuant. Um, he developed what he called like moisture, feel, felt like it was like sweating on top of it, um, but not having any actual drainage. Um, and it, he felt like it was impacting his mouth opening really wide. He said he was having a hard time eating any root, like big burgers or anything like that. Um, and it was also impacting his neck movement a little bit. Um, and then otherwise his review of systems was positive for um, a junky cough, um, as he described it with dark but not bloody sputum and some chest pain associated with coughing. Um, and then he also in the three days leading up to admission um, developed a pustular rash on the back, um, on his back and going up to his right shoulder um, that had been there for um, maybe three days. And then otherwise for relevant review of systems, um, he was having mild night sweats, but said they were overall much, much better since starting on uh, antiretroviral therapy. And he had actually gained all the weight back that he had lost um, when, uh, before he was diagnosed with HIV, the start of ARVs. No headache, no viral or URI symptoms, no dyspnea, um, no dysphagia or dinophagia that had all resolved, um, no drooling. Um, and no GI or GU symptoms or rashes on any other part of his body. So that's a lot, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Emily, that was awesome. Can I just clarify, what was the yeah. timing of starting on the ARVs relative to um, when the mass started? Yeah, so three months during that, three months ago during that first hospitalization for HIV was when he was started um, on the ARVs. And yeah. then it was about six weeks later when he had that, um, that first nodule. And then six weeks from there was when he um, came in for a direct admission. Got it. And the three months prior, the symptomatology at that time was kind of odynophagia, dysphagia. And um, what did, did they find anything at that time? 
Um, they found the candida esophagitis. The candida esophagitis, got it. Get started on ARV, six weeks later, pressural, and then six weeks later, this admission. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, Chloe, there is so much going on here, um, particularly in someone who, you know, has a background history of HIV and is coming in with, you know, symptomatology that we don't see that frequently. How do you, how are you thinking about um, the presentation broadly and, um, and the neck mass? Yeah, and then I just have one question to clarify. The CD4 count of 48, is that on this current admission? No, that was when he was first diagnosed with, um, with HIV. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just trying to first think about the timeline. Um, I think especially in someone with HIV, the timeline is super important thinking about when they were diagnosed, how long have they been on antiretrovirals? Um, what's the CD4 count currently, which obviously we don't have yet, but, um, just to kind of sum up the things I'm thinking about now. So, you know, he was admitted you know, with, with what sounds like candidate esophagitis, low CD4 count, started on and had night sweats, started on medications, was probably, you know, hopefully well controlled. We don't know how well he was taking his antiretrovirals, um, but was possibly well controlled or getting up to that point of being well controlled. Um, and then this small bump, um, I guess the things, I, I don't really have a, the things that, that I'm thinking about in a small bump, someone who's really immunosuppressed. Um, there are certainly like a myriad of infections that could present. Um, I don't know if this is actually like within the skin or under the skin, um, but like I'm sure TB could present like that. I'm sure there are some fungal infections. I'm sure there are some bacterial infections. I'm not sure. I know there are a bunch of spaces in the neck, so I'm not sure which space it's in. And that would kind of make me think about different types of infections. Um, but I guess a big bucket being infectious um, and then another bucket being a lot of cancers. Um, usually I would think about cancers in someone who has had HIV for a long period of time and has had a low CD4 count and then the immune system isn't really able to fight off um, and in, uh, fight off the developing cancer, but it's only been about three months since diagnosis. So maybe a little less likely um, for a cancer to develop in that period of time. Um, so yeah, I think my main buckets now would be like malignancy or, or an infection. Um, the, the other things, I guess the, the characteristic of the mass being red and fluctuant, not draining. Um, I mean, it definitely seems inflamed and then the skin changes overlying it. I guess that, that points me a little more towards infection. Um, and then on review of systems, cough with dark sputum associated with chest pain. I mean, it's hard to know whether to tie that into um, this neck mass or whether he also has um, some separate uh, pulmonary infection in the setting of being potentially immunosuppressed if he's not well controlled on antiretrovirals. Um, and then again, with this pustular rash, is it related or is it something separate, um, you know, because of potential immunosuppression? So those are my initial thoughts. And I, I guess I would love to know his current CD4 count and that would better help me frame it, but I will stay tuned. Chloe, that was awesome. I am right there with you. I feel like you sort of layered neck mass plus sort of like some of these systemic symptoms like fevers, night sweats and said, okay, we're gonna, we think that this is neck, plus, neck mass plus inflammation. In this patient who has HIV, I'm going to prioritize um, infection and malignancy. And malignancy in the setting of HIV is interesting because you know sometimes like um, Kaposi's, um, and there are other sort of types of cancers that patients can be diagnosed with concurrently with their HIV diagnosis. So it's not necessarily something where there is a latency between HIV and uh, malignancy development. Um, so I agree with you that having that um, bucket up there, um, right under or right next to infection, is important. Um, just to sort of, I think the thing that's standing out to me the most, just as you mentioned, is the neck mass. And so starting with like, how do I think about a neck mass? Um, I, like you mentioned, there's so many delicate structures there. And I think having kind of an anatomic approach to, to thinking about where is this neck, neck mass and what is it? Um, so thinking about like the skin, 
Um, so abscesses, you know, the, it looks like it's purulent and draining. So is this some sort of abscess? Um, there are vascular structures in that area as well. So things like carotid aneurysms can, can present as like pulsating neck mass, a little bit less likely given this description. Um, thyroid masses like goiters um, and other malignancies can also present as neck masses. Um, and then nerve involvement. So like paraganglion gangliomas can look like neck masses as well. I think the fact at, like using the location um, can be helpful in characterizing the neck mass itself. And I didn't actually get a sense of like where the mass is, um, but, you know, getting a really good exam of like, where is this mass um, can help us figure out kind of what structures are being involved. We're really worried about this neck mass, right? He can't open his mouth. Um, that makes us worry that maybe it's like progressing and involving other structures um, and causing trismus. So that's definitely a red flag sign. Um, so wanting to kind of evaluate this um, on the sooner side and then thinking about, well, is this like, could this be bulky lymphadenopathy in someone who we know has HIV and is predisposed to um, infection? And so things, types of buckets of infection that come to mind are viral infections like, um, EBV, CMV um, can cause bulky lymphadenopathy that can look like a neck mass. Um, bacterial infections like um, syphilis, odontogenic infections, um, group A strep, they all can form um, abscesses that look like um, really bulky cervical lymphadenopathy that maybe um, could present as a neck mass. And then fungal infections um, like Bartonella, tularemia um, can also lead to kind of this type of presentation. So um, I would say the big buckets, I'm prioritizing the exact same buckets that you are, infection, particularly atypical infections with this time course, so viral and fungal, um, and then malignancies, so in someone with HIV, lymphoma um, would also be on the list, and then, of course, TB um, in the infectious bucket can kind of do everything. Um, so lots to consider here. And then in the context of this pustular rash um, and the other review of systems, I think thinking about like, could this, whatever this process is, is it more disseminated than just what we see with the neck mass? Um, or is it kind of like, a, is it noise and not signal? Um, in someone with HIV, I would prioritize that this is probably leaving signature in multiple organ systems, um, but we will see. Any other thoughts, Vali and um, Anna? Um, I wanted to mention, actually, I, I'm really excited for this case because, um, well, as you know, I'm from Peru, and for, of course, the um, when mentioned about the patient with HIV and the neck mass, I jump onto TV. I just wanted to mention that it, um, two presentations really came to mind: scrofula, which is basically um, a dissemination from pulmonary TV, which we could also link to the respiratory symptoms, and then to the skin, and so. That is really important because actually you need a sample not only from the skin but also from the bone usually because of um, osteomyelitis as a possibility just because the dissemination is from the inside rather than from the outside and also the possibility of cold abscesses which would have more um, a less inflammatory presentation but a more subacute chronic time of onset and I actually have seen cases of uh, abscess of auto inoculation just because of coughing of the wrist or on the hand and also in the category of lymphomas, I wanted to mention um, some cutaneous lymphomas that I think could be linked to a patient with HIV. Um, as you mentioned, Smitha, the possibility of co-infection, here in Peru we see a lot of uh, HIV and HTLD1 co-infection, and so maybe like T-cell or adult uh, T-cell lymphoma. And also there's a variant of lymphoma or not Hodgkin lymphoma, which is really, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how, frequent it is, but it's anaplastic lymphoma, and it's a primary cutaneous lymphoma that presents in patients with HIV. It's usually like ulcers, and so maybe um, just what came to mind because of, um, of what I see here in Peru. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Vale. Um, Emily, maybe we'll turn it over to you for the second aliquot, and I know you have pictures, so let us know when you want to take over the screen and we can stop sharing. Okay, great. I'll save that for the end of this aliquot. Um, so just to run more systematically through um, the rest of his history, for other past medical history, he had um, was diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia during that last hospital stay. And he also um, had alcohol use disorder and opiate use disorder um, in his 20s. That's now in remission. 
Um, and then for meds, nothing else besides what I had said, besides his ARVs and the bathroom. Um, for his social history, um, he lives in the Central Valley, no travel to anywhere else um, besides the Central Valley and um, the Bay Area for his medical care. Um, he is employed as a um, personal trainer working from home with COVID. Um, and he lives with his long-term girlfriend and two school-aged children. Um, he has exposure to, um, to dogs and chickens at home, um, but no cats. And then not really a big outdoorsy guy. Um, so no insect bites or tick bites. Um, no family history that he is aware of. Um, and then for his vitals, um, his temperature was at 36.7 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, his heart rate was 100, um, but it was 100 after he walked himself up the hill to Parnassus <laughs> uh, and uh, subsequently came down to the 60s afterwards. He made sure that I should know that. <laughs> um, and his blood pressure was 143 over 76. Um, his respiratory rate was 18 and he was satting 98% on room air. Um, overall, um, he was very well appearing, um, interactive, friendly, um, and conversant, not ill appearing at all. Um, I'll save ENT for when I um, have the photos. Um, from the cardiac standpoint, um, he was, had regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs. Um, palm uh, was actually clear bilaterally with normal work of breathing. Um, no strider or any upper concerning upper respiratory sounds, and he wasn't drooling. Um, GI, non tender, non distended. Um, and then his extremities were warm and well perfused with no edema. Um, for his skin, he did have um, like scattered maybe like 15 to 20 pustules um, on his back um, with minimal surrounding erythema, and some of them were extending over towards his, um, his right shoulder. And then for ENT, I can share my screen. Let me know when you guys are ready. Okay. It says that the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So I can describe it first. So I'll on make you a co-host. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, great. You should be able to screen share now. Okay, great. So, wow. Yes, so I measured it, approximated um, like a right-sided six by six centimeter, um, uh, like both, it was firm around the edges, but fluctuant in the middle um, mass. And you can kind of see in the photo um, on the left-hand side, like um, areas where it just looks like it's about to burst, <laughs> um, where it looks like there's maybe some purulent material and like very fluctuant over that area. Um, and it was red and warm. He had pretty good range of motion of his neck, maybe a little bit limited in um, his extension. Um, and he was able to open his mouth actually pretty well for me. And then for the rest of his ENT exam, he had um, some cracked teeth um, on the upper uh, right molars, um, but nothing that looked like or felt like it had any um, abscess and no thrush. Um, and like I said before, he wasn't drooling. And I wasn't able to palpate any other lymphadenopathy anywhere, um, including anywhere else on the neck or the supraclavicular area or the groin. So I will stop my sharing. And that's the end of the second aqua. Wow, thank you so much, Emily. Really, really interesting. All right, Valet, we're up. Um, great points in the in the first aliquot, um, uh, Smith, like Chloe and Valet. Um, tell me a little bit about how you're kind of thinking about this patient. If there's anything from their past medical history that helps you in any way diagnostically, and then especially when you're um, uh, thinking about somebody with a neck mass, how kind of their vitals and exam, if that makes you feel reassured, less reassured. Um, tell me a little bit about how you're approaching that. Yes, yeah, so, um, well, with the past medical history, I think, um, well, the iron deficiency anemia, I would probably think about um, maybe, well, the patient is with, lives with HIV, thinking about malnutrition, um, and maybe uh, with the, uh, 
it, well, he has a uh, background prophylaxis, which is reassuring of the possibility of toxoplasmosis, as we saw in Monday's case, um, with the epidemiology of rural, rural areas, areas in the Central Valley. I'm not really sure. I think Central Valley, for me, maybe it sounds like something Kushal once mentioned associated to endemic mycosis, and that could definitely present as granulomatous disease uh, as a mass. So keeping that in mind, and well, uh, exposure to dogs and chickens, I, I will have to go maybe like if there's a pathogen that I don't remember, but with the neck mass um, and the virals, I, I think, well, the, the, the fact that the patient is a febrile is reassuring in a sense. I mean, he's immunosuppressed, so I wouldn't be so sure that maybe he's not put in like a febrile response. Um, he's tachycardic, which is something I, I always consider like a sign of um, alert on a way, and also the blood pressure, um, which is, you know, in the upper limit of systolic hypertension. And um, I think for, for the patient for, with a, with a like a neck mass that is compressing, maybe thinking about like uh, something compressing like the, the vagus nerve or something like causing like in that sense, like um, maybe a response that I'm not really sure I'm seeing on the vitals. But I think with the mass itself and the images that Emily provided that were really helpful, I'm also thinking about um, the possibility of TB as a, and also maybe others like granulomatous diseases and demomycosis, um, lymphoma definitely, and uh, also like actinomycosis, I think will present as a mass on the mandibule and, and the neck. And even though we don't see the classic like yellow sulfur crystals that are like super step one, um, Typical so, and also the, the fact that he has scattered pustules. I would like to see also that the pustules because maybe we are having like a presentation of something else or maybe part of the mass itself, like um, I don't know, sarcoma de Kaposi or interpigmented or maybe other type like lymphomas can also present with a very generalized type of uh, cutaneous presentation. So I would like to see them too. Super advanced discussion, Vale. What I really like, and I want to highlight what you did, is you both thought diagnostically about the case, but you also thought about like the implications of what having a neck mass in that place is, thinking about all the surrounding structures with like the vagus nerve and um, and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, we're um, thinking a little bit when I'm like seeing somebody with a neck mass, especially something that large, I similarly, like my like first steps are thinking about like the stability of the patient. Like Smith um, and Chloe had mentioned, there's so much valuable real estate in the neck, particularly thinking about the vascular structures and the airway and the patency of the airway. Um, and so it sounds like, at least from the vitals and the exam, we can feel pretty reassured. So we can take a moment to breathe and um, think really thoughtfully about our, our diagnostic approach. And I really love so many of the things, and I appreciate, you know, you've um, clearly learned a lot about um, uh, different infections that like are in different parts of the world. And those same buzzwords, the Central Valley, like bring up endemic mycosis, things like that for me. Um, I also really like when I'm thinking like diagnostically about this neck mass and like a patient who's coming in with inflammatory symptoms, also like not necessarily honing in on like an afebrile patient, but certainly they could still, um, you know, I would suspect that they're still inflamed just based off of their symptoms alone. I don't have much to add from like an infectious, um, uh, uh, Kind of perspective that has already been mentioned. Um, I wonder if um, with the patient's previous um, uh, esophagitis that they had, if they had some type of breakdown in the mucosal um, barrier at some point and then was able to translocate um, uh, flora into that space. Um, so that would be something, you know, that we would, uh, that we would be on the, the lookout for. Um, I love that you're bringing up um, some of the endemic mycoses. Part of, part of me wondered if with their um, uh, having like chickens and dogs at home, if like they're a person who spends time outside and if they might have exposure to like other like soil-based organisms like, um, like you had mentioned. Um, and so I think those types of things could similarly be on our differential. Um, 
thinking in the malignancy bucket, um, certainly, and just to highlight specifically for people who have HIV, it's like through their immune dysregulation that they're at risk for many different types of malignancies. The lymphomas are, um, are ones that I commonly think of uh, in younger patients. Um, but as Chloe mentioned, you know, they haven't had HIV, or at least they haven't been diagnosed with HIV for a very long time, but it's totally possible they've had HIV for some time. One of the questions that um, always helps me think about um, uh, malignancy in patients with HIV is how they came to acquire HIV and the types of things that they might be at risk for. Um, in particular, in thinking about somebody with a neck mass, um, a squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck associated with HPV in patients with HIV um, uh, is something to think a little bit about. Um, and so, um, uh, it would be interesting to learn a little bit how he um, uh, got uh, HIV and if he's ever someone who has um, partaken in like oral sex with men, um, he would be at risk for HPV inoculation of, um, of his throat. I don't know exactly where, but um, I know they're at risk for um, HPV associated SCCs of the head and neck. So that's just one thing maybe that we can add to our malignancy um, differential. Um, uh, in looking at um, the uh, the neck mass itself, what are some further steps of uh, workup that you think you would be doing for this patient valet? Like, what types of uh, what types of things would you want for them in the emergency department? Um, well, I think I would definitely want some. I, I don't think I would be satisfied with maybe like a, a chest rig or a neck X ray to see the mass. Maybe like an MRI. Um, and also, I think I will have, I would prefer to like, would like um, some um, PCR or amplification of nucleotide bases for, for TB, to rule out TB. Um, I think even like a, a sample of the mass itself, if it's an abscess, um, to see what's inside. Um, and I, I also wanted to ask you, because I was wondering if you maybe thought if this could, I mean, the patient has HIV, but I remember some sometime Ravi mentioned that um, patients with HIV not, are not only more um, not on risk or at risk to have uncommon or uh, infections, but also common infections. And so, with this rate of inflammation, I'm not sure if this. I'm like super convinced that this could be like something more so acute or chronic. Even though the time of onset, it's quite off for me think about something like like uh, the staph abscess or an strep abscess but I don't know how would you think about that yeah like about starting like antibiotics right away and something for them yeah I certainly I think um my uh what I'm like interested in is making sure that uh we rule out an infection I think with that probably being like the most likely cause and like all comers coming in with like uh a neck mask that looks like there's pus in it and it's about to explode. Um, so the one thing I'm reassured by is the patient's clinical stability. So I think we'll probably have a little bit of time to collect diagnostic information and perhaps even try to get some potential microbiologic data itself, depending on maybe what our imaging shows, because I agree the patient should get uh, detailed neck imaging um, to look at the soft tissue. And then perhaps once we get that, we could see if we could get any microbiologic data. I think we would be able to pull the trigger and probably empirically treat with antibiotics until they prove to us that they don't have an infection. Even off the um, something that I remember often from like taking care of uh, patients who have cancer, like their um, the cancer itself or like the masses, they can kind of become like necrotic, and then that also itself is a nidus for infection. So it's totally possible that it could be like two things in one. Um, but I would want the help of some infectious disease colleagues to um, to probably help guide some of those treatment decisions. Um, uh, let's see, the only other, the two things I wanted to add. So I think um, the patient coming in with like this productive cough, one of the things I wanted to highlight is any really subtle, uh, subtle symptomatology in a patient who at least previously had very poorly controlled HIV, I think warrants some um, evaluation. So even if I'm hearing totally clear breath sounds, I'm probably going to go for imaging. And I think starting with a chest x-ray is totally fine, but if there's like really any smidge of abnormality 
in a patient who's this immunocompromised coming in with symptoms that we can't really explain, and there's quite, quite a bit of diagnostic uncertainty, more detailed cross-sectional imaging, something like a CT chest would be helpful. And then I agree with you, Vale. I think doing an image of the neck with like either a CT with contrast or an MRI, and I would just be like talking to the radiologist on the phone about, this is what I see, what type of imaging do you think would be most helpful for me? Um, and then with the pustular rash, kind of puzzled. I'm really, really bad at dermatology. Um, some things that jumped to my mind when I heard about it. So while it sounded like it was on the back, there was perhaps some localization. And so I started to wonder if for a patient who, um, who is immunocompromised, if they, if this could be like a presentation of zoster in the setting of, you know, systemic illness otherwise, and perhaps it doesn't confine totally to one dermatome because they're immunocompromised and they may be prone to uh, more dissemination. Um, uh, when I think about postular rashes, I also always think about a disseminated gonococcal infection. I think somebody in the chat had like asked about any tenosynovitis or anything, but I think like the period that the rash had been going on for without like him being super, super sick probably makes that less likely. I think of syphilis as well. He's been treated and I'm not totally familiar unless he like perhaps had like um, neurosyphilis that was like undiagnosed or something like that. And so he still has like more, um, uh, more like burden of disease in his body that's reactivating or, or whatnot. And then, um, sweet syndrome is another thing that I think about, which is like a, a neutrophilic um, dermatitis that can be associated with like a whole array of inflammatory disorders. And I don't actually think would provide us like a ton of diagnostic field to talk about. It's just like something kind of like the pyoderma um, uh, that we can see um, or like erythema nodosum. It's like something that you see in the setting of other inflammatory illnesses. Um, and, or maybe it's just like bacterial folliculitis, um, but something that, you know, we'll want to keep on our problem list and think a little bit more. But I think thinking about um, zoster, um, especially with the propensity to become disseminated and um, uh, would be um, a good idea. Um, let's maybe turn it back over to Emily to hear a little bit more about what, what type of workup was done for the patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, to answer some questions that I come up, I had forgotten to mention sexual history, um, and he probably acquired HIV in his 20s um, in the setting of having sex with men, but in the last like four or five years had been monogamous with his long-term girlfriends. Um, so can go through some labs for you guys. Um, I'll go slowly. Um, his sodium was um, 138, uh, potassium 4.2, uh, chloride 101, bicarb 27, BUN 16, and creatinine 0 0.93, which looked to be his baseline. Um, and blood sugar uh, was 109. Um, his LFTs were all normal. And then his CBC, um, he had a white count of 6.1 uh, with an entirely normal differential. Um, his hemoglobin was 11.0 with an MCV of 78. And his platelets were a little high at 551. Um, and then uh, basic inflammatory markers were obtained and his ESR was 61 and CRP was 30. Um, we had gotten LDH, which was 178, which is normal. And then to answer Chloe's question, um, his CD4 count is now 197. Um, and his viral load was detectable, but less than 40. Um, and then we obtained blood cultures, um, uh, mycobacterial cultures, many other like urine histoantigen and coxy immunodiffusion and fixation, a lot of things that take forever to come back. Um, and uh, then we also, for STI testing, we, it was a little early to recheck in our PR after treatment, but it showed a decline from one to 32 to one to 16. Um, and then we swabbed uh, three sites for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and all three of those were negative. Um, and then given our concern for it being fluctuant, we started Unison. Um, and then for imaging, it started with the, um, so like, um, I forgot who had mentioned it, we did get, um, just cause it was quick to make sure. And since the mass was really big, we did get lateral, um, 
lateral neck chest, uh, lateral neck x-ray to be able to make sure that the, um, the airway was open and patent, which it was. Um, and then we got a chest x-ray, which I can show. So this was the chest x-ray, um, and then I can pull up the read with it. Um, and he'd had x-ray during his last admission. So it was notable for new widening of the mediastinum um, with a very broad differential of uh, either of the vascular catastrophe, uh, lymphadenopathy, esophageal dilation, um, and we had recommended a CT of the chest. And then um, over here, you can kind of see some like new uh, bibasal or um, like hazy opacities and maybe some mediastinal fullness. I will stop there. Amazing. It just keeps getting better. Jeez, Emily, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, Chloe, what, um, what is standing out to you? How are you kind of um, contextualizing um, the labs and then um, also the uh, chest x-ray findings? Yeah, so just to go through it a little systematically, um, Nothing super notable on the CMP. Um, for CBC, his white count of 6.1, I mean, he has HIV with a pretty low CD4 count. So that doesn't sway me towards or away from infectious at all. I guess I don't really know how to interpret the normal differential in the setting of HIV and potential infection, but that's something I would wanna look into and see if I can try and parse out based on the differential rather than the number alone. Um, for his hemoglobin, I think he had a history of iron deficiency anemia, which fits that. Um, his mild thrombocytosis could be reactive in the setting of, of whatever is going on. Um, his ESR, CRP, no initial thoughts there. Um, his CD4 count, I mean, I think we kind of all expected it to be low. It's not like dramatically low, but it's below 200, which puts them at risk of um, a lot of different infections, both opportunistic infections. And as someone mentioned, um, the typical infections, he's at increased risk of getting all of those. Um, and then pending all those interesting micro studies. Um, as, so that for the STI um, GCCT negative, um, now we can rule out disseminated uh, gonorrhea, which someone mentioned. And then the chest x-ray um, for the widened mediastinum. I know that I once had like a mnemonic for this and I'm not remembering it, but things that initial things that are coming to mind are um, like TB or lymphoma or just some like really uh, bulky lymphadenopathy from any um, severe infection. I know there are some, some other things in there that I'm probably missing, but you know, if, if it's related to the neck mass, I guess, you know, it, I think it doesn't really pull me towards or away from infection versus malignancy. Um, but I, I am thinking a little more about TB. And did we get any, uh, any TB studies? I don't know if you mentioned that. Um, we um, did get TB studies and put them on a TB rule out. Okay, got it. Cool. So yeah, those are my initial thoughts. That is awesome, Chloe. I agree with you. I think um, the plot thickens when we get to the, the x-ray and just um, to echo a lot of the points that you um, made looking at the labs, they're, they're fairly unremarkable except for, you know, these um, sty high um, inflammatory markers. And we know the patient is inflamed, which is sort of confirms our hypothesis um, that, you know, probably our highest suspicion is that this is an infection um, and malignancy is also on the differential. I think it's interesting that the platelet count is a little bit elevated. You know, some of the things that were on our differential may associate may present with thrombocytopenia, like some of the lymphomas and other liquid malignancies. The fact that there's thrombocytosis suggests um, is more consistent with chronic inflammation. And then um, solid malignancies can often, um, are more likely to present with thrombocytosis than thrombocytopenia. So I think that fits um, with our suspicion that there is some sort of chronic inflammation or chronic infection or chronic malignancy going on. Um, and then um, the fact that the, um, 
the fact that the RPR has sort of come down nicely suggests, you know, one of the things that Anna had mentioned was, could this pustular rasp be, be consistent with secondary syphilis? And I think the fact that he um, has had this um, robust response suggests perhaps less likely. We think that he's been um, treated at this point. Um, and then in terms of the negative gonorrhea and chlamydia, one of the things that I've learned from um, one of our um, infectious disease faculty is how fastidious um, gonorrhea in particular can be and how difficult it can be to grow, um, the fat is especially from the um, oral pharynx. And so, um, you know, whenever I see a negative test, if the rest of the clinical syndrome is so is really consistent with that thing, I always sort of um, have to question the test, particularly um, in the setting of um, an organism like gonorrhea. But I agree with you. I think we were already less suspicious just without the um, without the other things that we think of, like the tina synovitis, um, and um, given that he has been monogamous for um, five years, per perhaps a little bit less likely, and maybe we'd be more inclined to kind of believe a negative test in this case. Um, and then chest x-ray, I think, speaks a lot to kind of what Anna was, Anna and Vale were saying earlier, is that we're seeing sort of evidence that there is um, more to the story than just what meets the eye with this neck mass that um, potentially there's either dissemination of kind of an invasive bacterial infection that's causing this mediastinal lymphadenopathy and whatever is going on in the, um, was it in the left lower lobe? Oh, in the bilateral basis. So we at least know that we have something in the neck something in the mediastinum, and then something at the, um, at the bases. Again, I think just given the presentation, our highest suspicion is for infection. Um, and so getting some cross-sectional imaging, like a CT of the neck, and then also scanning through the chest at this point might be helpful um, to get a sen better sense of what we're dealing with. With a widened mediastinum, that could be everything from a widened aorta to a widened, uh, sort of just thinking about structures in that area, to um, a widened esophagus. We know that he had this um, issue issue with esophagitis in the past. And could that, you know, I don't know very much about um, other things other than sort of like um, a mechanical cause that might lead to a uh, dilated esophagus that um, leads to widening mediastinum. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, but we know that we have signature and all of the things that we were talking about earlier, like TB, like, um, like, Bartonella, like histo, like all of the endemic mycoses can also cause the mediastinal um, lymphadenopathy. Um, so I think at this point, um, everything is basically still on the table and I would be getting cross-sectional imaging. It sounds like he's already gotten um, some empiric antibiotics and given his stability, I think we have some time to get diagnostics. The other kind of question that I had was, um, would there be utility in getting like an ultrasound of the neck mass itself and seeing if we can do a fine needle aspiration? Um, certainly for um, lymphoma, um, if you had a negative fine needle biopsy or an inconclusive um, FNA, we wouldn't be done there. We would uh, need to investigate further and potentially uh, try to get an excisional lymph node so we can actually look at the architecture under a microscope um, to better make the diagnosis. But um, I think that's probably a good place to start is um, to think about getting a CT of the neck, a CT of the chest, and then potentially sampling um, the fluid or tissue that's in the neck mass. Um, I think that's that's probably... It just, and then the other question is just sort of um, with the rash, could we sample the rash to see if um, we can get um, better diagnostics there? I also am not very good at derm. And so um, I think we have a lot to focus on and probably a lot within the, uh, the thorax to start. Um, but I think, I think that's a good start. Um, Anna and Vale, any other thoughts? I just wanted to add that uh, a great point, I think, is that um, you mentioned that the fact that there's not like cavitary lesion that could be very typical of TB. And I just wanted to mention that I find really fascinating that, I mean, I'm not saying that this could be necessarily TB, but if it was the case, um, usually patients with living with HIV don't present a cavitary lesion because HIV, when invades in macrophages, actually causes in the lung, specifically um, decrease of the activity of metal proteinases that are like the little enzymes that eat and produce the sputum and the cavitary lesions. And so because of that, we will also have less basilary um, findings if we do sputum studies. And so I will definitely go for like a more molecular diagnosis just to be sure because we do have like a false negative. And I find that also really fascinating because they actually um, 
contrary effect is done in the ner nervous system in which actually the contraction of TB and HIV causes an increase in methylproteinases, and because of that, there's more likely a, a nervous dissemination. So, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, are we ready for the last aliquot? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so you guys are all asking for advanced imaging, uh, which is great. I reached out to our radiology colleagues and our ENT colleagues, because I did foresee, like Smitha had mentioned, um, an ENT procedure in his future. Um, and they felt pretty strongly about getting an MRI, just because like you guys had mentioned, the neck is like a very delicate structure and being able to identify exactly what this is would be helpful. Um, and then at the, that point had ordered, and it was overnight, so we couldn't start with an ultrasound. And miraculously, the MRI scanner was open. Um, so we ended up getting the MRI pretty quickly, and then the CT of the chest. And I expanded it to the abdomen, pelvis, to be able to look for dissemination afterwards, even though nothing was really localizing there. Um, so I can share my screen and show you guys some screenshots of the images. Let's see. Okay. So I don't look at many MRI nets. So when I see something that's very obvious, I know that, <laughs> that something's really going on. Um, so this is just a rep representative screenshot um, in, um, and you can see on the, well, the left side of the screen, the right side of him, um, that there is this, um, what they called multi-loculated rim enhancing collection um, in the right neck with lots of edema around it. And then the scary line was extending into the right uh, paravertebral space and possibly extending into the mediastinum, um, at which point I got pretty worried uh, for mediastinitis. Um, and then they were also worried about um, like multiple abscesses. And I had asked them if it looked like it was coming from a lymph node because the, the mass itself was actually, I was expecting it to be lymph node with a little bit of pus or something, but it was actually mostly pus, um, but it did, they couldn't, they were kind of hedging on whether it was coming from a, um, a true lymph node or not, or if it was just multifocal abscesses um, in worse on the right side of the neck. Um, and then after that, um, got a CT chest. Um, which showed like extent, extensive dense um, consolidations, particularly in the right middle and lower lobe. And then also in the left upper lobe, which I didn't depict here with some clustered nodules and tree and bud opacities. And then um, probably what explained the, um, the mediastinal widening was the um, multiple um, bulky necrotic mediastinal and hilar lymphadenopathy. Fortunately, they didn't see any signs of the abscess at that point tracking into the neck, which is what I was worried about clinically because it's a pretty scary diagnosis. Um, and then they commented on the esophagus um, and how there was like a pedunculated lesion in there um, and a thickened appearance. Um, but overall improved from prior since he was treated with the fluconazole. And then expanding it down to the abdomen and pelvis, um, since we were worried, like you guys had said, about a um, diffuse, uh, like widespread um, lymph node process, there was a single enlarged um, mesenteric lymph node that was 1.1 centimeters with central necrosis. And then some vague findings in the spleen that they don't think were there before with several um, low attenuating lesions. So that's the imaging. Um, and then uh, um, he called ENT uh, the next day and he underwent actually a bedside um, since it was so superficial, um, a bedside IND where they, um, there was a lot of loculations um, and, but they were able to drain 65 cc's of what was frank, um, frank pus. Then they put packing in it. Um, and then uh, um, at that point, his antibiotics had been broadened to unison and vancomycin um, as well. Um, and then slowly things started to trickle back. As you can imagine, all sorts of studies were sent from the fluid, um, including regular bacterial cultures, um, AFB cultures, um, this universal PCR that we have in case anything ended up being um, being negative and also sent for, um, for cytology as well. Um, but they didn't get any actual like lymph node tissue um, since it was mostly pus. Um, it did grow staph epi on um, one out of one of them. Um, and then other studies that ended up slowly coming back um, were histo, um, urine antigen ended up being negative, coxy immunodiffusion um, and complement fixation were negative, CMV and EBV um, 
viral loads were negative um, from the from the serum. Um, the MAC uh, cultures were still pending. Um, and the TB rule out was still pending, um, but the um, like the MTB PCR um, was uh, negative, uh, the gene expert. And then eventually a study did return uh, confirming the diagnosis. All right. Um, I presume that's the last bit of information before the final diagnosis. Okay, we have three minutes before the end of the hour. Vale, why don't you take us through what you think is the most imaging and high yield um, imaging finding that you would try to build most of your differential from? Um, I'm really, really not sure. I would say that um, the, the sign of uh, like a normal signal in the lung apex, apex makes me think like, there are certain microorganisms that like the lung apex better, TB one of them, but I mean, the gene expert, of course, makes me doubt of that possibility. And as mentioned, TB is not that common as, as the other mycobacteria of the complex in, in the US. Um, but th that, and also the fact that there's like a various lymphadenopathy, like disseminated lymphadenopathy, not only in the thorax, but also in the abdomen. And, I'm really not sure. Like this, I think this is systemic, and there's with the patient with HIV thinking about um, the endemic mycosis, which have negative. But I'm, I mean, the urine antigen for me, especially. I know it's not that good. I'm not 100 sure, but I'm not sure if it will be like a complete rollout with it being negative. But but I'm really lost, Anna. So so please help me with with the imaging. I was hoping you could help me because I similarly am lost, but um, something I really appreciate that you did is thinking about specifically test characteristics in like a, a case where I feel like our differential is really broad and we're sending for um, many different, especially like microbiologic data, thinking specifically about test characteristics, how sensitive and specific are these different tests? Do I feel really comfortable saying this is definitely not disseminated histo based off of a single urine antigen test is a great question to ask. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. I do not know the answer to that question, but I would be looking it up. Um, I think the thing that I am gonna build most of my, um, uh, what I, where I feel like we can build a lot of um, uh, diagnostic yield from um, the presence of um, these like multiple abscesses. I'm trying to like between multiple abscesses that seem to track along tissue planes or necrotic lymphadenopathy. Um, those are the two things that I'm wondering about. And I'm thinking the multiple abscesses um, that like seems to be like dis we are like, I feel like I've heard say like disobey tissue planes. Um, will probably get us quite a bit of diagnostic yield. That being said, I feel like I struggle interpreting that in a person who we, is still immunocompromised, even though they have a normal white cell count, their CD4 count is still low. Um, and so um, I, uh, that would be, um, I think where I'm gonna build a lot of uh, diagnostic um, uh, momentum. When I think about things that um, uh, are can cause abscesses and cross tissue planes, I think about like just really gnarly infections um, in the um, kind of bacterial um, bacterial bucket. Um, I think about things like staph. There are certain like strep species that behave like staph. I think things, I know like things like Pseudomonas and Klebsiella are abscess forming, but I don't know if they're super aggressive and like will cross tissue planes. Um, other bugs that I think of, so I think Nocardia is one that can cross tissue planes. Actinomyces, which is something you brought up really early on, um, is another one. Um, and then honestly, I'd be leaning on my ID colleagues um, to, uh, to guide a lot of this um, workup. I still think um, that the um, idea of this being like a disseminated, um, a disseminated mycobacterial infection is possible. Um, and then I think thinking specifically both about TB, but then also like non-tuberculous mycobacterial diseases, especially for like cutaneous manifestations with like a little, there's like a little bit of a pulmonary signature here with some tree and bud opacity. 
um, which would be the distribution that we would see non-tuberculous mycobacterial um, infection. Um, uh, but I would, um, I would be leaning so heavily on ID right now. So I think um, I'm going to put my, um, my foot in the bucket of infection. And I think it's going to be some type of um, uh, bad infection, like, um, like bad, bad strep staph or um, something like nocardia or actinomyces. Um, and yeah, that is, that's what I'm thinking, but I'm really curious to hear um, how, if you have any further thoughts or if, um, if Chloe or Smitha um, have any other um, thoughts or things that they feel like could be the final diagnosis. I would just throw fungal in there. I know fungal infections can really disseminate, um, not to broaden our final, <laughs> putting our nickel down on multiple things, but um, yeah. Ali, do you have a guess? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna agree with Anna and think about, I mean, it's gonna be really, I don't know, maybe this is like a staph infection or a staph multiple abscesses and it would be really funny, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure. I have nothing to add. Yeah, oh, I, yeah think we're, take this I think home. we're juggling with the same things that you guys were, we were like, oh, he has HIV. He's like in this time course of starting ARVs, like all of these crazy things could totally make sense as like a component of iris. But then we were like, oh, it's like so purulent and he has these caries. Like, is it just something that's like typical that like any immunocompetent patient could get? Um, but then um, about a week into his hospital course, um, some of the, the cultures that were sent, uh, sputum cultures and um, cultures from the, um, the IND ended up being positive for acid fast bacilli um, and ended up speciating to um, MAC which was really interesting and like super surprising to me because in my, granted I haven't seen too much MAC, but it wasn't something in my mind that was so frankly purulent um, or would track across planes like that. I would think of it more as the necrotic lymphadenopathy, um, which was really interesting. Um, and then he was started on, um, they started him on uh, clarithromycin and ethambutol. Um, and now he's doing great. Um, he left with packing um, in his neck, which has been uh, painful, but otherwise he's doing okay. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool case. I'm glad we got an answer. <laughs> That's amazing, Emily. Do you want to share? Um, I feel like you might have some teaching points for us, and this is a diagnosis that I'm sure, or at least I have not seen um, much of it all. So I'm really interested, but you learned from this case. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when I first heard his story, the time course just fits so well with iris or immune, um, like the immune, uh, reconstitution and inflammatory syndrome, um, which basically is just like kind of unmasking of infections that you didn't know were there that the immune system kind of wakes up and it's like, okay, we have to attack this. <laughs> um, and uh, I was reading a little bit about this. This typically um, will, patients are at higher risk for this if they um, have a pretty low um, CD4 count nadir, often under a hundred. Interestingly, this doesn't apply to TB um, and patients even with CD4 counts above uh, 200 uh, can present with TB iris, but it's the case with most of the other pathogens. Um, and it was all of the stuff that you guys had been thinking, the common things being mycobacterial species, whether um, TB or non um, or NTM species, crypto, coxy in our neck of the woods in San Francisco, um, histo, can also have um, CMV or viral infections and HSV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B can often be culprits, um, or HHV6, which is Kaposi sarcoma. Um, and then the time course was interesting looking into it. It can, um, symptoms can start, can range. Um, the average um, amount of time to symptom onset from starting ARVs is around 42 days. So he was actually quite right in that window. Um, and, but it can range as early as a few weeks um, up to um, like a few months after starting ART. But interestingly, he was starting an integrase um, containing um, regimen. And those are some of the more potent ARVs that we have. So you often can see um, the first manifestations of iris um, sooner with that. Um, 
And then just thinking about this case in particular and thinking about HIV, um, I think kind of as Anna was alluding to, um, you always get into a point where you're, oh, should I lump these diagnoses together and find a unifying diagnosis or should I split them up? And I feel like HIV patients can have so many um, different uh, types of opportunistic infections and other infections that I feel like in this patient, I was definitely splitting things. Um, and then also thinking about non HIV related infections um, as well, like you guys were talking about with um, the uh, abscesses related to um, the oropharynx. And then interestingly, also some things you can, um, we were really focused on the the, um, the pustules and thinking that could be a link and thinking we could get um, things from the pustules. And we had dermatology see him and they were kind of laughing. They were like, well, it turns out with this neck mass, he uh, now is not able to sleep on his side like he normally sleeps. So after the last like four nights, he's been sleeping on his back and he's been a little bit sweaty. So they didn't end up doing a biopsy or anything. <laughs> so I think those are all the points I have. Emily, that is fantastic. Thank you so much um, for teaching us. Um, Anna's comment, I don't think we do prophylaxis. Yeah, right. Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So, um, so now with ARVs being so um, great and really people having um, a great response with their CD4 counts pretty quickly um, with ARVs, the only times you would start patients on MAC prophylaxis with azithro is if for whatever reason, they're not going to be on ARVs is I think the typical practice pattern now. Right. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for teaching us and everyone for joining this morning. Um, let us know if you um, would like to participate um, in the coming months. We would love to have you. Um, and I learned so much from you guys. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Emily, for joining and Chloe and Molly for discussing. Thank you. Maria, I'm so sorry we didn't have time for teaching points. No worries. No, no worries at all. The last teaching points were great. <laughs> you wrote down a lot of good ones. Yes. <laughs> you can write them down. You can read them later. I know it's late for everybody. You it's both okay. were fantastic. Thank you for being so on it. Awesome. Have a wonderful day. Bye, y'all.